Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Good morning. I hope you've had your hope you've had your coffee. Um, so last night at the Arizona Bio Industry Awards, we had the pleasure of hearing about these three wonderful uh, companies um, that leaders in our bioscience community um, uh, diligently and probably through sweat and tears. <laughs> have led and created, and I'm excited to be able to um, do a deeper dive into that with each of them today. So, um, you know, the, the, the Fastlane Award companies, this was, the recognition is um, in honor of having achieved outstanding milestones in the past 18 months, and each of the companies that um, these, uh, the, these three colleagues uh, represent um, have had just truly re remarkable um, successes over the last um, 12 to 24 months. So congratulations. Um, so Marian Guerrera, uh, president and founder of Aesthetics Biomedical, Rick Morello, CEO of CND Life Sciences, and Richard Austin, CEO of Reglagene. Um, and I'm going to hand over uh, the mic to Mary Ann so that she can uh, introduce us to Aesthetics Biomedical. Although I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a, a twist. A couple of years ago, um, I think it was at a white hat, Mara, um, had, um, as part of the introductions, had also asked each of the panelists to just give a fun fact about themselves, and it actually really helped. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to do the same. <laughs> you go for it. A uh, fun fact, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but when I was starting the company, talk about challenges, um, I was uh, jogging and I was hit by a car. Um, and so the first uh, start of my uh, company was uh, from my couch, um, trying to do business and holding my meetings um, at the house and, and around. So uh, it, I don't know how fun it is. I was going to say, I don't know the fun fact, but that is an interesting you know, fact. It's a, you know, and it's perhaps something a metaphor. Perseverance is what it says, is that, you know, don't let anything get in your way. Uh, so fun fact, I guess maybe the roots of even getting into emerging companies and startups. Um, so I've always been interested in sort of building, you know, the puzzles from scratch and working with great inventors. And so my actual foray into all this was starting um, a nonprofit um, about 20 years ago focused on the financial distress of cancer. And it was literally those moments of a paper napkin exercise, and and I think I still have the paper napkin somewhere. If, if we did this and did this and did this, I think we can solve it. And people said, "Yeah, sure, Rick, that's that's great." And so, luckily for the community at, at large, uh, it took off because it was a real big unmet need. And now we're working with the the, the Biden White House and the Cancer Moonshot. So that was the 20 year take a paper napkin and it actually can turn into something. Yeah, so absolutely. Okay, my fun fact is that uh, before I started taking uh, uh, business, I guess, so seriously, my thing was cycling. And so uh, I moved to Arizona like 26 years ago, I think it was. And uh, because everybody was on bicycles, I did that too. And uh, whenever I turned 40, I was mountain bike state champion in this state. So that's my that's my thing. And so I was very proud of that. So Well anyway. done. Well done. And now that I'm an entrepreneur, I don't get to ride as much anymore. So Fantastic. it kind of sucks anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, and so my, I'll, I'll say my fun fact is, unbeknownst to me at the time, I was at Merle Haggard's last concert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, now, thank you for indulging me, Marianne. You, why don't you tell us a little bit about aesthetic uh, biomedical? So, um, not to repeat some of the stuff that was last night, but um, I started um, the company because I had an opportunity. I was with BioXL, and we were looking at uh, different technologies. And um, I spent most of my career at the National Institutes of Health dealing with what I call very serious science. And I moved out here because of TGen. Um, so again, very serious science. Um, and then I started a BioXL, which is a nonprofit incubator to help startup companies in the biosciences and medical devices. So when this opportunity for aesthetics biomedical came to me, uh, it I said I, I felt like I should take a shower uh, because uh, I viewed aesthetics as not serious science. And um, so I went and I talked with um, uh, uh, Rich Bowles, who was the president of um, Air's, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, but it just feels a little uncomfortable. And what he said to me is he said, you know, Marianne, you, you have no idea how much money we spend as people age and they 
can't deal with it and they are depressed and we have to fund them and we can't, um, you know, there's nothing that really helps them and a lot of money and they don't feel relevant anymore. And that really struck me because I was aging at that time and I still am, um, as all of we uh, us are. Um, and so that kind of got me over the edge and now I really do see that, um, that as people age, um, they aren't relevant and they really need aesthetics. So um, I started the company and we were able to um, take a device that we got from Korea and we, you know, I raised $1.2 million. We launched um, that um, in March of uh, 2016. We sold our first device in May of 2016 and then we were profitable that year and we continue to be profitable. And Basically, we've only, um, we've never had any VC funding. Um, we've done it all um, on our revenue that we got from selling and our consumables. And um, it's not been easy. It's been very, very tough um, uh, to, to do that. And um, I wouldn't recommend it. I'd recommend that you get investments. <laughs> um, but we have, um, since we started, um, actually created two products. Uh, one is uh, Somi Skin Care, which is a product that um, 22 natural ingredients and you put platelet rich plasma from an individual into the serum and it keeps those platelets in their natural state for up to 120 days. Um, that's important because typically your platelets degranulate in four to six hours. So for any of you that are in aesthetics and you know platelet rich plasma, it's like having a PRP treatment twice a day at home. So we were the first personalized topical skincare product in the world. Um, and we have patents issued around that. And then the second thing we did, which is what we did in the last 18 months, uh, is we got FDA clearance on a new device uh, for radiofrequency microneedling. And what we did is we again went to the personalized route. We added an ultrasound handpiece so we can look at the individual's depth of their epidermis, their dermis, when you hit fat, and know exactly, precisely where to uh, deliver the radiofrequency so that you have more effective outcomes and more safety for the patient. And we got that cleared in October of 2000. Uh, 22, and we manufactured the first one in, two th in J January of 2023, and we are selling it um, here now. And all of it has been done. So me and uh, the Vivace Ultra with Vision Handpiece here in Arizona, um, nowhere outside of Arizona. That's, that's just tremendous. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Rick, why don't you uh, introduce us to CND Life Sciences? Yeah. So thanks. So. I think the, the, the real uh, allure for me and what CND's mission set out to do was really the, 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 the innovation of three neurologist founders that, that have been studying neurodegenerative diseases for you know, their entire careers, two, Drs. Roy Freeman and Gibbons at, at Harvard, at the Beth Israel, and then locally, Dr. Todd Levine at Honor Health. And so I had uh, met them several years ago as they were kicking around the notion that Obviously, in this next decade, we hope to see the breakthroughs both in diagnostics and therapeutics for diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia and so on, but we're not going to be able to get there unless there are convenient and accurate ways to actually diagnose these diseases, understand that they're not singular diseases, they're probably subtypes just like we see in oncology, and we need to be able to find ways to detect early because if the drugs are going to work in the future, we need to catch these diseases before the sort of that, you know, neuronal uh, pathway leads to, you know, nerve death. So they came to me and said, we are pretty sure based on a decade of research that we can find the proteins that are the culprit of these diseases just a few millimeters beneath the surface of our skin. And to be able to look inside the dermal nerves and see that we can effectively light up the protein, in this case, alpha-synuclein in the misfolded form, and be able to offer this in a 15-minute skin biopsy procedure in a neurologist's office, and, and in the future, maybe in a primary care physician's office. And so the first thing, you know, coming from different worlds of there, you know, I've been in diabetes areas and oncology areas, and so this was new. And I said, so let me understand this. These are central nervous diseases, really hard, and you're telling me you could detect them early just a couple of millimeters in the skin. You're crazy. <laughs> and of course, 
They've studied this for years and that's why they're world leading scientists. And so as they took me through it, I saw the publications were there. I saw that there were routes to then say, how do we take this to market if you're right? And of course, as people who start up companies or think about starting up companies saying, is there an unmet need? Is this the right timing? And will the scientific and physician community take two decades to agree with you? And in this case, the literature was there to say these are understood pathological processes. And so we then had a couple of seed investments, one by Honor Health, which was really allowing us to take off right during COVID and set up the lab uh, first in Phoenix, now at the Pima Center in Scottsdale, where we've got you know, 26,000 square feet of space. And we found a way to bring it out to the market. And right now is used by about 1,000 neurologists and about this year, about 10,000 patients. And then the key, which I was talking to someone earlier, is how do we take the playbook of oncology and say, there are actually signatures that we see so that it's not just, again, one disease. These are sub-diseases that we need to be more specific about. And that's sort of the next part of our, of our phase. So we're very, very excited. We built a, you know, a company from five people during COVID to now about 80 people here in Scottsdale and are getting real everyday clinical use by neurologists. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, Richard, why don't you tell us a little bit about Reglagene? Thank you. Reglagene, we are a drug discovery and development company. And what we're trying to do is imagine a world in which serious brain diseases succumb to powerful therapies that can do what others can't. So if you watch the video last night, I gotta say it again. We all have this thing called the blood brain barrier. And we've heard about it, it's in the news, stuff like that. It keeps toxins out of our brain, it keeps our brains healthy. But that's the number one problem in developing new therapies for brain diseases is simply how do you get your therapy to navigate the barrier, to get into the brain. And at regular gene, that's what we're good at. So uh, where we've decided to start is an area of high unmet medical needs. So if you think about brain cancers, so whether it's, you know, primary tumor from glioblastoma, the disease that took the life of Senator John John McCain, or it's, a, or, or, or it's a metastasis from breast or lung cancer, unless those patients present with a handful of rare mutations, there just simply aren't the drugs for them. And they live about a year after that first diagnosis. So what we've done at Reglagene is we have discovered a drug molecule that we affectionately call RGN6024. It doesn't have a, a real name yet, but it's RGN6024. And what it does is it works by targeting the most well-validated target in the history of cancer therapy. I'll use the technical term. It's a, it's a protein called tubulin. If you've known anyone with breast cancer, they likely saw paclitaxel somewhere along their journey. There are seven FDA drugs that target this very same protein, and they've achieved clinical and commercial success and, and saved literally millions of lives, unless a patient presents with brain cancer. And that's because none of those seven are able to navigate the blood-brain barrier. And that's what we do. So RGN6024 that we are preparing to uh, uh, bring into its first in human trial, um, uh, it achieves more than 14 times the brain penetration of, of, of the next most brain penetrable tubulin targeting therapy, whether on the market or experimentally in the clinic. We're doing with our molecules what others can't. And best of all, the therapy works. In our animal models, we are flatlining tumor growth relative to today's, relative to today's standards of care. Orally administered therapy makes its way into the gut, into the bloodstream, past the blood, past the blood brain barrier, into the brain to whack very aggressive tum to very aggressive tum tumors. So as I said, we're getting ready to go into our uh, uh, phase one and what we're having to do now is those studies that show to the FDA that when we dose patients we're not going to kill them and that we can manufacture the product reliably so we're doing those those animal studies now to show that it's safe in developing that manufacturing process and I'm delighted to be at Mayo today because uh or right next door to Mayo. I, I don't know which we are here at exactly but uh, but we're also working with the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale uh, Scottsdale, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, to uh, help us figure out how to dose this first therapy relative to today's standards of care for the greatest effect. 
Um, Regazine is more than a one-trick pony. We've also found that the, the, the molecules from our patent state also are potent blockers of, in, of in inflammation. Inflammation in the brain is where neurons go to die. And so you can imagine brain penetrant, anti-inflam, the sky's the limit. Our path to immediate growth as a company is through cancer, but we've got these other indications in our back pocket, and we're just delighted with, with, what, with what we are holding. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Richard. So, Rick, you and your team at CNT Life Sciences um, have chosen Arizona to be your, your headquarters. And obviously, you, you, know, you mentioned in your intro there is a connection with one of your co-founders, but I'm curious, what is it that um, has attracted you to Arizona or has attracted you to keep the organization and really build it here in Arizona? Yeah, so um, with the technology uh, license from, from the Beth Israel in Boston, one question was, should we build it there? And I, I lived in Boston for 13 years, love Boston. Uh, and as, as many of you know, in the last uh, 10 years, the amount of development in Boston and Cambridge and the seaport with every biopharma company on the planet is just breathtaking. And at the same time, that comes with costs. <laughs> the competition for talent, the price of real estate, um, as an example, the ability to go get you know, sort of similar lab space in, in that geography was literally three times the cost as it was to go here in you know, the greater Phoenix Scottsdale area. And then we said, what other anchors can we rely on here? And they were great ones. I mean, obviously institutions like Honor Health um, a history of strong diagnostic companies here. Um, if we are going to recruit uh, everything from laboratory technicians to quality engineers to others, we had pools of people who were incredibly excited to come meet with us, even when we were this you know, little engine that could in some lab that looked like a makeshift dental office. Like, I mean, they, they said, we're super excited to be part of this mission, and they brought experience from great places here. So when we did, and we looked at that equation and we said, we've got some amazing anchors, it's economically advantageous, we've got the talent, we've got great companies to look up to. Um, so that, that made it really easy for me to recommend that while we love Boston and we're gonna do some work collaborating with our founders at Harvard and we're connected to other you know, amazing researchers there, uh, this was you know, sort of an easy choice and we haven't regretted it at all. Okay, thank you. Um, so Marianne, um, Aesthetics Biomedical, uh, it, it began as a distributor, you, you know, developed your own biologic product, then developed your own medical device, so really how has Arizona's life science ecosystem kind of helped you and your team um, in your success along the way? Well, I, it's been huge um, uh, to our success. Um, as I indicated, we were lucky enough to get started with um, selling um, our device and bringing revenue in. Um, but when um, COVID hit, um, we actually had a $10 million term sheet on the table in February of 2020, and they withdrew it in March when COVID hit. And so there we were faced with you know, um, and, and actually then revenue slowed down too because it was aesthetic offices, physicians offices, and they were shut down. So they're not buying consumables, they're not buying devices. So it was pretty traumatic. But I remember getting on the phone with the team and saying, we are not gonna slow down during COVID. We are gonna keep this going, we're gonna keep development going. And so we really, um, you know, we turned to PADT, who is our design firm, and we worked out, um, and we worked with them to advance the design of the device, um, which was um, because we knew we didn't want to be a distributor anymore. So we had to get the device <laughs> designed and cleared with FDA before our contract ended with the distributor. So we really, I had no choice but to say we've got to find a way. And Eric uh, Green at PADT was um, amazing in helping us get that developed and working with us on advancing that. Um, and so that has been huge. And actually, you know, we're on payment plans because he's worked with us to do that. Um, and then AZ, um, AZP, which is Arizona Prototype, is a manufacturing group. 
they did the same thing. We're manufacturing, they're excited to be manufacturing the device, and so they too work with us on how can we get this done and how can we manage it, you know, and work with our cash flow and, you know, with things to come. I mean, and, and I don't think that would happen in Boston. It doesn't happen very often where groups, um, in fact, we looked at another manufacturing group and they said you have to pay everything up front, um, you know, rather than until you work with us three or four years, and then maybe you can pay 50% of it or pay it at the end. I mean, and we couldn't do that. We wouldn't survive. So um, without those folks, and then DSV is another group that we've worked with inventory management, um, and they have, again, worked with us. So we would not, because we didn't, we didn't get any investment, and we are operating on pure revenue that we generate ourselves, um, we, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So I am very, very grateful to um, those groups. And, um, you know, I think that the startup community um, should be really um, knowledgeable that you've got these partners that will work with you um, and that they trust that you're going to be successful and that they're going to benefit in the long run. The short run, it's tough for everybody uh, in the long run, and, and hopefully we won't have COVID again. So <laughs> you know, just have to deal with that too. For a variety of reasons, yes, fingers yes. crossed. <laughs> um, so uh, Richard, um, Reglagene has a, has a close relationship with University of Arizona. How, how have you been able to leverage that to really assist with driving the success for your organization? Well, the U University of Arizona has been a part of our story right from the beginning. Actually, the way I became mixed up with Reglagene was serving as a commercialization partner with Tech Launch Arizona. I saw this technology that I loved, uh, didn't think about it much more, and then three months later, I was being recruited to be the CEO of a company to pull this uh, technology out of the U university. Um, the thing that we've really been able to leverage here, you know, not not just, you know, and, and, and of course, too, you know, there, there was mentoring from Tech Launch. I'm a big pharma guy, Sanofi, Glaxo, more than 30 years in the business. And so this entrepreneurial world was brand new to me whenever, um, uh, whenever I helped found the company. And so really getting that coaching uh, was, you know, first from Tech Launch a little bit there. And then, uh, you know, I we quickly became partners with the University of Arizona Center for innovation and uh even though we my gosh I, it's, it's embarrassing to say say it out loud sort of because it people wonder what you've been doing all all, all these years we found out a company 2016 um and uh became operational 2018 here it is 2023 and i still have executive coaching from uaci because i feel like you're just so so much left, left to learn um so uh, uh one thing that we do that uh was brought out on the video last night that's really been crucial for us is the way we leverage university resources to keep our costs down. So we have our lab bays on campus. And I want to be abundantly clear, we're paying market rates, but those market rates are at the university are much less than market rates anywhere else. I would, uh, if you want to catch me after and hear, and let me just tell, let me just tell, tell you the numbers. I don't want to say it out loud, but I mean, it'll knock your socks off for, for, for how little you have to pay to, that anybody has access to to have access to world-class labs, world-class equipment, world-class people. And it's a relationship where we work with each other. Um, I'm putting drug industry professionals on campus, and the university loves that because they have faculty that they want to encourage to be entrepreneurs, and they're working side by side, well, side by side, next set of lab bays over, you know, with, with the people on our team. And, uh, and, the, and the university looks at us as sort of a good influence, you might, might say, on them. So I, I tell you, whenever we need something, you know, even remotely special, like access to a piece of equipment, can you write the program for this liquid handler for us right now? Um, uh, they do it for us because, you know, we take care of each other. And so it's just been a beautiful relationship. I just hope it runs for a while more because we still need them. And, um, and, and two, you know, just to sort of contrast our, our, you know, our story, we are a drug discovery and development company. Reading, but that means we don't make revenue. So it's, so it's all investor capital. You know what the venture capital world's like now. We haven't broken in those ranks. We are still in angel investor land. IND enablement starting to cost us some money. And so we have to watch our pennies every day. And the university helps us to do that. And, Again, it's a deal anyone can get. You just got to go looking for it. So anyway, yeah. 
Thank you for that. So Marianne, you've been, as you've, you've indicated, right, you've been active in our life science ecosystem for two decades. So how have you seen it change over time? It's obviously grown, um, and um, that that's good. I, I think um, what's happening at the universities um, and the Mayo here, that expansion is really important uh, because you can access um, ideas, technology, things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, I think um, we've got, <laughs> you know, I hired an intern uh, from ASU, he was a biochemist and biomedical engineer, and um, after three months, I turned him from an intern into a full-time employee. He's now director of our innovation, and he's been the inventor of both SoMe and the device, and has five patents issued under his belt, and he's 28 years old. So, I mean, it, it's a win-win because, you know, you can take advantage of uh, this, the brilliance that are um, surrounding us, and in a startup company, you can let them go and just really flourish, which I love. It's just like, you know, um, I don't want to push anybody forward. I want to, you know, I want to have to grab them after they're, you know, falling off the edge. But you know, because it's it's too much work to, you know, to be pushing everybody. You want them to run, and you want to let them run. So I think when I look at this uh, community, that has been really an asset is to have that around. Um, I think. Um, I'd like to see the venture world has grown. I mean, access to capital has grown, which is really good for a lot of the startup companies. Um, unfortunately, it's in select areas. And, and that's, um, I, I'd like to see that change because, you know, when I try to get VC money, there's, you know, it's not available. I, I don't fit their sweet spot. You know, I, you know, I'm not SaaS. I'm not, you know, AI these days. Um, I use chips in my devices, uh, but I'm not a chip manufacturer. So, um, you know, I'd like to see where, you know, a company like mine contributes to mm -hmm. greatly by hiring and all the things we use to being able to get some support back to help grow it further. We have 50 employees we're giving back. So I think that we've grown, we work together, we collaborate. Um, but where we really need to do is to get more of the, the VC uh, funding for across the board so that Arizona is, you know, um, really the ultimate bioscience company. Um, because even in what I do, um, in aesthetics, we started doing clinical studies. We did two major clinical trials for our SOMI skin care. We published two papers. Um, we did things that were, you know, not always what's done in our field. So we're trying to bring it to a higher level with what we do in um, our aesthetic community. And again, that is important for Arizona because you want to not just be in one little sweet spot because we know times change, right? Today, this is hot. Tomorrow, this is hot. You know, um, and then again, you want to be able to, um, you know, build that so that if we're successful, we can give back to other companies that need to have investment. So um, I, I think that we've come a long way, but I, but I really feel we can't sit on our laurels and say, you know, we're we're there, we've accomplished it. Um, so let's toot our horn, but let's be realistic that there's still a long way to go. And I know Joan wants to double. Um, you know, what we're putting into the biosciences and, you know, um, I think that we, we need to do that, but we need to make sure we're doing it where we're supporting the companies once they get started. Great. Thank you for that perspective. You know, as I, as I listen to uh, the incredible stories um, that, that you all have shared, you know, I, I, things that resonate with me is, you know, your entrepreneurial thinking, um, the um, innovative uh, approaches um, that you are taking to really kind of bring novel technologies and therapies to market. And I think underscoring all of that is the fact that there is, um, it requires collaboration, right? And that you all um, have really leveraged that um, and have made it a strength that has really driven and fed your success. And I think that um, those are three competencies that I, I see in the Arizona bioscience ecosystem. Right, so I think that what you all have demonstrated embodies really what is going to, you know, is imperative for, for other um, leaders to be successful at really being able to 
um, bring forth their innovative ideas, um, you know, really partner with our, our ecosystem and, um, and hopefully um, bring, you know, bring forward uh, and implement kind of these, these, these new tools and these new therapies that are really going to help all of us, um, you know, in our community and globally um, in the future. So I, I just thank you for, uh, <laughs> for all the persevering through all of the ups and downs to get there. Um, I'll ask if you all have any closing comments before um, I turn it over to the group for Q&A. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll uh, uh, a, a dog and a duck walked into a bar. No, yeah. yeah. Let me think. Okay. Yeah. I mean, no. You know, I'll I have to play off that. You know, because you know, anytime you talk about capital, it's just, it's just a thing. You know. I mean, um, I can tell you, a company like mine, we felt like we had to win at home first. You have to win at home on on the capital front, and so we hit Desert Angels hard. That's our Tucson, you know, angel investor group, and so we won at home, and that really helped us get started. I mean, we won at home when when i mean my goodness can you imagine what it's like whenever we don't have a drug product yet we don't know what it looks like and we have people that are willing to write checks into our company just because they think we're reasonable people you know i mean that's the kind of investment we had to get to start with you you you, you don't get that going over to the next town the first question you get asked is why didn't you get money out of tucson and if you didn't get money out of tucson no one's writing you a check and so what we've been able to do is to take those early dollars and some grant dollars as well Got to call out the Flynn Foundation. We were a company for two days when we applied for their bio entrepreneurship pro, pro, uh, program, and we won amazingly. Uh, but but you know it's it's leveraging those early dollars to actually build something that looks like it has a shot, and then you know it sort of snowballs and other you know so like again we're still stuck in angel land. I don't want to you got to keep saying that you know but now it's angel groups all over the country that are willing to write checks in into our uh company and uh you know and we're able to show you know what we think the product looks like and what the exit looks like and how far away it is and um uh and, and it's just that now we need to make that transition to what i you know i think i use the term capital big leagues and um uh and we feel like you know we've got a we've now got a molecule that you know with all the full proof of concept we're doing those you know those uh, toxicity studies it looks safe we're there now. We just got to cross that. What you call it? The Rubicon? Was that the word you used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we've got to cross that now. That's and and that's the next big uh, uh, challenge for us. Of course, we're hyper confident. We we believe we have the story. We you know that we can sell this thing. We just you know, but you know, it's it, it's all in the doing. So, uh, uh, e e you know, echoing what you're saying, you know, there are venture capital funds that are operating in our state now and. We've knocked on all those doors and we haven't opened them yet, you know? So, uh, I mean, you know, and so, but you know, we've, we're knocking on doors all over the country now. Yeah. But anyway, I'll, I'll shut up about that. I just whine a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's very good whining. Very effective. Um, I agree. I mean, I think the, the theme of scrappiness and, and the, this state and the ecosystem, I think is an awesome place to be scrappy. You can be scrappy again in places like Boston. It's just a different, it's a different level of, of you know competition and egos and so on and so forth. And I think I found here that you know people leave their egos at the door a lot uh, more readily and easily than other markets. So we were scrappy early and and Honor Health started an innovation fund and we're glad to help us sort of get off the the sort of self funding um, you know sort of real early days. And as we all know, I mean, sometimes all you need is one first anchor that leads to the next steps. We had Honor Health as an anchor. The next anchors were get a couple of really good grants. And so we, we did win a key NIH SBIR grant. And now we start building that credibility. And then other people around the community say, I heard about this. Tell me what you're doing. I'm interested. And you know, kind of, you know, within six to 12 months of being scrappy on the financing side, we had built a $5 million seed syndicate and it all was around this ecosystem and scrappiness. And then, you know, leveraging the AZ Bio membership and, and Joan's been awesome with us. And, you know, we saved hundreds of thousands of dollars on our build out in the, uh, our lab build out because we remember like no questions, like overnight, 
We got a proposal from a great supplier that we were not, you know, sort of had any membership benefits, and we got a great quote. It was 50%, and that was, you know, massive. Uh, interns, we have our employee number one who was a, bio, a, a biomedical engineering grad at Arizona. He's also, I think he turned 28 yesterday, and the stuff he's doing is just incredible. And then we, we went and and have summer interns at, from ASU who are doing AI with us. I mean, it, I think you have to have that level of scrappiness. And, and I think as we all affectionately say, we love VCs, but we love to maybe wait a long time before we need to bring them in. <laughs> and so I, I think we've enjoyed that scrappiness environment here and we'll be so much better for it you know, in this next chapter. Scrappy is good, I, I think, because you really leverage and you learn and you're creative. And, and so we, we've been scrappy, and I think that that's good. Um, I'm really pro-economic development. I mean, so part of what we're doing here is advancing the biosciences, but we are advancing the community. Um, and I worry that, you know, um, that if we don't have the kind of investment we either don't get great companies off the ground and then really fully benefit the community, um, or you know, we, we don't grow as fast as we can. Um, and so that, for me, is like I look at my, my life today. If I had that $10 million, if I had funding, I could you know, triple manufacturing. I could triple sales, and I could do that. And I can't do that now. So, you know, I'll do it eventually, but this community could benefit a whole lot faster if we could get some of the resources to advance us faster. You know, I like, I love slogging along, you know, I'm, I'm good at it, you know, but I'd prefer, you know, at some point where, you know, you don't have to do that, where you could really turn on the gas and, and show this community what can be done and keep people here not moving out of the community um, because, um, we can't, um, you know, we've got to go to California to get money or we've got to do something else. So anyway, I love the community. I want to thank everybody who has been a supporter. Joan, I've, Joan and I have known each other from day one, I think. And um, if it wasn't for this community, um, we wouldn't be here. And, I, and I'm very, very grateful for that. So thank you all. Yeah, absolutely. It was interesting. I, I attended the, um, the health innovation economy um, session yesterday. And, um, you know, it, it, there was there was obviously quite a quite a bit of discussion around the investment that has been made um, in really kind of bringing forth innovative um, healthcare solutions. And, um, you know, if you take a step back and, and take a look at it um, and, you know, uh, a large, uh, you know, byproduct of easy bio success over the last 20 years, there has been substantial capital investment in the infrastructure side of what is needed so that our companies can be successful. And Kieran, um, who's an Easy Bio board member, actually, I, I, I wrote down his um, his comment because he said we need the complementary capital in the or in the for the organization. So because if someone's just looking at the investment and the dollars that have been made, they may say, why do we, you know. Uh, uh, naively say, why do we, why do we need more capital coming into the state? Exactly, it's a nice building. It's a, that you know, if they build it, they will come, and it's okay. Well, they built it. Now we need them to stay. And so there's so much, there's so many technologies and great companies. And you know, Richard, I think Reglagene is a perfect example of it. I mean, there's there there companies are going to go where they have the opportunity to be successful and we've got you know we're, we're we've got the infrastructure um, now um, and more is coming um, uh, in order to support that but we need to be able to have the funding to keep just tremendous organizations like yours healthy and growing in the state of Arizona yep all right I will open uh, the floor for Q&A Hi, uh, thank you very much for your comments. I've enjoyed them last night and I enjoyed them today. You guys have accomplished quite a bit and thank you. I'm Jack Sokoloff. I'm gonna um, moderate the one o'clock session. So I'll give us a plug uh, <laughs> ahead of time with, with uh, Mr. Michael Chambers, founder of Aldebaran. I, I've invested in and quite frankly supported many companies very similar to all of yours. And as far as the aesthetics goes, it's a wonderful area to be in. Your challenge is manufacturing and distribution and that's, that's where your capital is going. 
Um, and quite candidly, it was very impressive to see what, what you've accomplished given the challenges of, of R&D in that area. One of the things I was going to comment to everyone on is that the IPO market is totally constipated, which means the, P, the PE and VC markets are also constipated, which means that strategic aggregation and strategic partnerships are becoming dramatically more important. And for the first time in my career, I'm seeing 10, 20 billion dollar strategic aggregation financing solutions. We saw this in the physician practice management industry just this year alone with the Summit, Cigna, Village, MD aggregation. I think last year we had Jeff LeBenger here in our Bench to Billions series and that 1.6 billion dollar PE um, um, uh, purchase peaked out at 9.8 billion earlier this year and is part of a 25 billion dollar private company. So to cut to the chase, um, have you guys looked at any types of strategic aggregation capital from individuals that could be significantly both partners and beneficial financers for the next stage of what you wish to do? We have. We're engaging in uh, quite a bit of that. We've got uh, in two sides of it. One is um, on like the SOMI side where it's uh, more on the skincare. Um, also, you know, uh, another factor our product is amazing for like wound healing, right? Now we can't even go down that path because we don't have the resources for that. So we're looking at are there other groups that might be able to use that and, you know, that would be see the benefit of that. So, um, and other big uh, aesthetic companies, you know, how could we partner? Um, we have dialogues with that. How could we do investing? One of the things you have to worry about, I think, is if you get investment, from a strategic partner, then they sometimes want to have the right of first refusal, then that keeps you from being able to potentially interact with others. So there's a lot of navigation um, that you have to do with that. Um, but we are, I would say, in active discussions with a lot of that because we have to. Um, you know, um, I, I, my preference would be is like if we could raise two to three million now, roll out that manufacturing, then we really can leverage that. You know, we're at that tipping point. So, um, you know, but we are pursuing all of our different options. But if you have any ideas or any things, I would love, love it because, you know, you talk about risk and we were talking at breakfast is that, you know, nobody wants to fund you because of risk, right? Well, there is no risk. We've got the FDA clearance. We've got manufacturing down. We've got it in sales. We're selling it in Europe. Um, what risk is there? Now, all you need to do is get, we need funding to hit it out of the ballpark. So, you know, um, but any thoughts you have on outside of just, you know, investing, that'd be super. I'd love it. One of the key issues you're, you'll have to make the decision about is whether you're going to go for professional level distribution on the medical side or whether you're going for pure aesthetic distribution on the commercial side because you really can't do both easily. So that's just one piece of small advice. Yeah, I, we I learned that on both having a, a topical skincare and device. It's, it's too broad. I think on, on our side, uh, it's a very, very relevant and current topic of uh, strategic pathways that um, probably arrived a bit quicker than even we suspected. Maybe that's because some of these companies are being opportunistic because they know about the rest of the financial market, you know, is sort of sitting back a bit. Um, and so all of those classic considerations come in. You know, how much are we going to give up in terms of optionality down the road? What can we leverage from that potential partner slash investor now? Um, and those trade-off decisions uh, are also, we haven't mentioned, you know, having a healthy board that can sit back and make those dis discussions and decisions with you. Um, and so we're, I think we're, we're in the throes of that right now. Uh, and that came out of going to, you know, JPM in January and just sort of doing the normal, I saw Joan there, it was, it was raining cats and dogs when I think I saw you. And at that point, we had had uh, adequate seed money. So, of course, the best time to go there is when you don't need the money, right? And so, you you know, you walk the halls, you get, right, yeah, of course. Um, and so you walk the halls and you go have these meetings and we just said, let's just go and say, hey, we just want to let you know we're on the radar screen and we're doing some interesting things. And that led to, again, some people being a little bit more opportunistic and now we've got to make some, I think, tough choices around those. But... Um, yeah, so more to come there, but 
I do think, and the other thing that even in our space, there were some companies that you know put out an announcement that they got twenty million dollars of philanthropic investment from a foundation, and I said, where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> Right? Was that was was that like God or what? What happened there? Like so, um, but I think we have to be creative right now. So, I'll, I'll, you want me to take that? Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. I'll, uh, yeah. So for us, uh, again, we're a therapeutics discovery and development company. You know, I because I made the offhanded comment that we don't make revenue. That's you know. A company like ours, we'd love to exit before we ever, you know, once you show a human proof proof of concept. Um, so uh, uh, those strategic partnerships, when you're in discovery, still trying to figure out your molecule, no one wants to do a strategic partnership with you yet because you really don't have anything that, that you're saying is the one. So we just crossed that actually in January. And uh, where we are today is with those partnerships, we've got the bargain hunters we're talking to, the people who want to get your asset on the cheap. And uh, they're not ones who can make us happy or anything like that. Uh, the bigger players, uh, just to, to go into um, uh, drug development speak, is, uh, you know, they want to see the uh, uh, two species tox work that you have to do for your I and D. And that's, that's the work we're doing now. We'll have it largely completed before we go to J.P. Morgan, and we'll be rolling it out and hitting it hard, seeing if we can win that. I, and I can tell you, too, someone talk, talked about their board. My board is banging on me hard to get a partnership. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely right what, what you're saying, at least, at least in the world I live in. All right. You, I've heard J.P. Morgan twice in the last minute. So... JP Morgan, for those of you that you know do go to JP Morgan in January, um, AZ Bio has now hosted for the last decade um, a opening cocktail reception at JP Morgan on that Sunday night. And during that cocktail reception, we partner with other state bios and we're now partnering with Massachusetts, Virginia, Biocom in San Diego. Um, Bio New Jersey and others and Bio Michigan. And so what that does is it's bringing together life science innovators and life science investors from multiple markets all as we're getting ready to start off with JP Morgan. So um, AZ, you all get the AZ Bio in the loop. Um, if you're going to JP Morgan, start watching because the invitation will start being posted there and um, it is by invitation only so reach out to us and you can join me and richard henrick at jp morgan all right big round of applause for our panel <laughs>